the quantum picture of bonding, such as the tight binding total energy model, uh, is not always necessary for you know, getting a good picture of a bonding. For example, we saw that, that we can represent uh, secondary bonds using a 612 model, and in, in the case where the bonds are, are highly polar, uh, when there's a large difference in electronegativities in the, between the species, uh, we have an ionic crystal, and it's possible to consider this uh, from a uh, phenomenological perspective. So consider uh, sodium chloride. Probably you know, the best known uh, uh, ionic crystal that, that uh, we all learned you know, in grade school. Uh, in this case, uh, the electronegativity of sodium, 0.93, and the electronegativity of chlorine is 3.16. Uh, note that whenever you're dealing with electronegativity, you have to make sure you take them from the same scale so you don't want to mix molecule and uh, Polyangular electronegativities, but let's let's uh, take these and uh, Na plus the energy adding the energy of ionization will produce an ionized sodium and an electron that's uh, available. If you take chlorine plus an available electron, you will get a chlorine ion plus the energy of electron affinity. Um, if we think about the bond between sodium and chlorine in a uh, uh, you know, some type of a spherical a symmetry between the positive and the negative charge. The observed bond length is 2.8 angstrom or 5.293 or radii, otherwise known as an atomic unit. Uh, we'll have a more detailed discussion of atomic units elsewhere. Uh, right now, what you should know is that working in atomic units allows you to get rid of a lot of the constants you would otherwise. So, uh, using uh, atomic units, the Coulombic energy is Q1, Q2 over R, uh, and working in atomic units, that allows us to express this as 1 over R, or 1 over 5.293 uh, atomic units. This is 0 0.1889 Hartree. This is a, uh, a unit of energy in atomic units. If you multiply Hartree by 27.2 electron volt per Hartree, you wind up with 5.1 electron volt per NaCl pair. 
and experimentally, experimentally, we find a, uh, uh, a bonding energy of 7.9 electron volt which you know this is not great but it, it's ballpark right so let's take and build a model uh, that will give us a phenomenological description of ionic crystals based purely upon uh, Coulombic bond. Okay? Well, there's you know, good news and bad news here. Uh, the good news is it is something that's going to work, and we know that we're going to get at least a, a right order of magnitude. Uh, the bad news is that these Coulomb interactions goes one over R, which means that they have to be added out to infinity. So you have to actually deal with these infinite sums of charge if you're dealing with uh, Coulomb uh, interactions. You can't just truncate it and say, oh, well, I only need to consider you know, the nth nearest neighbors. You actually have to take out uh, this full uh, sum. So let, let's see how we do that. So we're going to define uij as the interaction between the ith and the jth atoms in the crystal. So, and then if we think about the total uh, energy on just the ith atom, that's going to be the sum of j not equal to i, u i j. So this is the energy contribution These are the pair uh, energy interactions. Okay, that makes sense so far. And of course, then we have to sum over the entire crystal. So what we need is we need a reasonable expression for this pairwise interaction. And we're going to use the, the Born-Meyer potential. That's going to look like this. I'm going to write over here, I think. Uij is equal to lambda exponential of negative r i j over rho plus or minus q squared over r i j. Okay, so this uh, born mayor uh, expression, uh, we have a repulsion This is going to be a short range repulsion. And in fact, if we wanted to, we could have used a uh, 1 over 12 potential similar to the uh, similar to the Leonard Jones, but this functional form is going to be uh, advantageous uh, as we get on in the, uh, in the calculation. And here we have long range. attraction and repulsion.
So that's why we have a plus or minus here, depending on uh, if we're talking about uh, attraction or repulsion. In this expression, our uh, lambda and our rho terms, uh, those are just empirical. Uh, these are going to be uh, They're going to give the uh, uh, shape to the uh, repulsive expression. Now, uh, because this is a short range interaction, we can actually break up uh, this term uh, to whether we're talking about nearest neighbors or we're talking about the uh, macro uh, long range terms. So we can instead write uij is equal to either lambda x negative r over rho minus q squared over r if and n, if it's nearest neighbor, and it's minus because in an ionic crystal, all the nearest neighbors have to be opposite sign, or plus or minus 1 over pij q squared over r. Okay, so up here in this Bornmeier expression, we have q, which is the, the charge. Uh, and Rij, that is the atomic distance, or the uh, atomic separation. Uh, down here, we're getting rid of that, and we're getting rid of that, uh, replacing Rij with a Pij, which is a dimensionless distance, and R which is the nearest neighbor distance. So that allows us to write this nearest neighbor term else uh, in terms of our nearest neighbor distance, and it allows us to write this other one in terms of uh, PIJR. So I'll point out here that uh, RIJ is equal to P I J multiplied by capital R. So P I J R is our one over R I J term there. Okay. So now we have something which looks reasonable for our uh, potential. And we can come back here, and we have the energy contribution of the ith atom, which is the sum of its interaction with all other atoms minus its interaction with itself, because that can't happen here. And this means that now the total energy of the system is equal to n ui, where n is the number of atoms in the crystal. And we can write this as n z lambda x negative capital R over rho minus alpha q squared over capital R. So in this expression, z is the number of nearest neighbors. So we're starting to incorporate, uh, we're starting to incorporate the uh, geometry here, um, and we're also lumping in terms in this alpha. 
So this alpha is called the Madelung constant. Or made alone, uh, as I remember it to remember the spelling, a uh, Madeline constant. So alpha is defined as the sum j not equal to i of either plus or minus p i j. So what we've essentially done now is we've been able to express the total energy in terms of geometry, a couple empirical constants, and this Madelung constant. And the Madelung constant is where we are putting all of the long-range interactions. So if we want to, uh, to work with this, uh, it's actually pretty convenient to work uh, at the equilibrium separation. So let's, let's think about that and say if we want to find, uh, find the minimum, I will change colors here to, to highlight this. Uh, if we want to find uh, the, the uh, U capital R sub zero, that's the minimum energy and R zero, uh, that's the minimum or the uh, nearest neighbor separation that gives you the minimum energy. So it's optimal. And, and distance. And this is the minimum energy. Well, that will come by taking the derivative of u tote by capital R and setting it equal to zero. And if you do that, take the derivative of this, you get negative n z lambda over rho exponential negative r over rho plus n alpha uh, q squared over r squared. And we'll set that equal to zero. Now, saying equal to zero implies that now this r is actually r sub zero, or um, r naught, because that's what we're solving for. And if we do that, it means that we can now write uh, r zero squared x of minus r zero over rho is equal to rho alpha q squared over z lambda. And I did that just by rearranging this, this expression. And the reason I did that is we're not going to solve for r0 analytically, but it gives us a term here, which when we can then take back and substitute back into our value for the total energy. So we can now combine this into this, and I'll change colors again to keep it clear. So that means that our total energy You tote uh, at R zero. So let me uh, write out. I'm going to take this R zero squared. Let me go 
r naught squared at the bottom there. So now we've got exponent minus r naught over rho is equal to this term. Substitute this into here, and we get is equal to n z lambda alpha q squared rho over z lambda 1 over r naught squared minus alpha n q squared over r naught. Okay? We get some cancellation and we wind up with u tote r naught is equal to uh, n alpha q squared over r naught rho over r naught minus 1. And this, I'll, I'm going to collect over on this side because we'll be using it again. This is u tote is equal, uh, u tote at the minimum, uh, or at, the, at the optimal separation, so the minimum total energy is equal to minus n alpha q squared over r naught 1 minus rho over r naught. And this term on the left, this is called the Madelung energy. And this rho, uh, it's actually a, a fairly short range interaction. Turns out rho can be approximated as around 0.1 or not. So now we've got an expression uh, for the total energy, and this all depends entirely on the geometry, this alpha term in particular. So the question is, how do we get this Madeline constant. How do we determine that? And uh, that's going to be actually a fairly lengthy process uh, because it's not actually a uh, particularly easy term to get. And the reason for that is because you have to make some infinite sum over the entire crystal to get it. Now, there are special cases that you can solve. Like, for example, consider a 1D chain. If you have a one-dimensional chain of positive and negative uh, ions, say plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, like that, if you have that, and your capital R is the separation between them, then you can write alpha over R is equal to 2, 1 over R minus 1 over 2R plus 1 over 3R minus 1 over 4R plus dot dot dot, right? Because each point here is uh, 2, uh, which would be the value of uh, Q in uh, atomic units, and that would be plus R minus 2R plus 3 plus uh, minus 4, because we're oscillating between attractive and repulsive. And because we've got a 1 over R here, that means that we can write alpha is equal to 2, 1 minus 1 half plus 1 half minus 1.
sorry, one third plus one third, sorry, one minus one half plus one third minus one fourth, dot dot dot. And because we know there's an infinite series that tells us that the natural log of 1 plus x is equal to x minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 minus x fourth over 4, dot, 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 dot. That means that we can express alpha is equal to 2 natural log 2. Uh, but it's only special cases like that that we can you know, write a simple solution. Otherwise, we have to figure out how to make up a general summation over the crystal. And you know, you think, well, we can do that, right? There's certainly ways that, that we can write out these sums. For example, it might be handy if we collect blocks of charge that are charge neutral and we add these together. So let's say we have let's imagine no uh, zero uh, uh, dimensional or sorry two dimensional crystal. together charge neutral blocks. Let's say we could get clustered together, you know, blocks like this. And we could perform uh, we could perform uh, quadrupole sums over each of those and then add them up over the crystal. Well the problem is we could do that, but we could also do this. And we can add those. And you would think to yourself that if we take these sums, we're adding up the same stuff, right? They should come out the same. They don't. Turns out the sum over different blocks are not equal. And this type of mathematical math, this type of mathematical situation is, is called uh, a conditionally con a conditionally convergent summation. And, and that's uh, a bit of a bummer. So, uh, how do we get at it? Well, what we do is we're going to break the sum up into two parts and have the sum of two sums. And we're going to break this up in a special way to give us a uh, two parts that are both uh, totally convergent. And this method is called an Abel sum. sums in order to make them converge in the fastest way possible. Uh, but here I just want to show you the, the general outline and you can look in the literature if you want to find an, an ABOL sum which is going to be useful for you. So the problem that we're interested in solving is we're interested in solving uh, this Poisson equation squared phi r. So that's our 
our charge density. And this is our potential. Okay. So the way we're going to proceed is we start out with Say it's a 1D so uh, 1D chain of charge. And if that's what we have, then our <coughs> excuse me, our charge density looks like this. We've got uh, Dirac deltas that are located that are located right on top of each of the atomic sites. So this is going to be uh, our charge density. And the way we're going to break this up is we're going to break this up and we're going to have uh, erase this two terms. We're going to have uh, rho is equal to rho 1 plus rho 2. Rho 1 is going to look like this. And I'm going to pick uh, I'm going to pick this as my reference because I'm going to be doing the sum about a particular site. Uh, and if I do that, I'm going to leave these just as empty placeholders. Uh, first charge is going to be this. It's going to be a set of Gaussians that are located on every site, excluding this is a one the Gaussian. on every site excluding the reference site. Our second charge distribution, again keeping our reference site here, and keeping our site index, will be Point charges in our direct deltas, and on top of each of those direct deltas, we're going to put a Gaussian of opposite charge. Two. So if I take row 1 plus row 2, I will get a positive Gaussian minus uh, another equal and opposite Gaussian plus a positive charge, which will give me my total charge distribution. And in doing this, and in doing this, I will have returned the total charge density, and as it so happens, row one and row two are uh, totally convergent. So let's let's write these out and look at how we're going to solve these. So row one, which I guess I'm using purple for, so let's go back to purple. Row one. 
want to break again into two parts that I want to call row A plus row B. Uh, row A I'll make row A in uh, orange. These are our sites. Row A is going to be an infinite sum of Gaussians. And I'm going to mark this as my reference site. And row B. I'll write that in uh, let's do that red. Row B is going to be. single Gaussian. And I'm sorry, but it has to be a minus sign here. It's row A minus row B. Okay. So, part 1A. One 1A is a Gaussian in each unit cell distributed out over infinite space. And we can solve this by transforming into reciprocal space through a Fourier transform. And I've got notes on this, but I'm going to just jump ahead and tell you that the solution to an infinite sum of Gaussians is this. Four pi divided by the uh, cell volume sum over G S G G to the minus two exponential of minus G over four eta. Okay. This G is our reciprocal lattice vector. And you'll see more of that later. Uh, and SG is the structure factor. And this is just the same structure factor that you see in x-ray diffraction, right? In x-ray diffraction, we're basically uh, looking at the Fourier transform of the charge density of the atoms that are in each unit cell, you know, spanned out in you know an infinite lattice. So this SG is equal to Q x negative i g dot r uh, this q is our Gaussian um, again g is our reciprocal lattice vector and r is the center of charge Sending completeness here, I'll simply write out that G is equal to M1 B1 plus M2 B2 plus M3 B3, where MI, these are inner 
temperatures and B1, 2, and 3 are uh, reciprocal lattice vectors where Bi is defined as 2 pi over V cell A J crossed into A K, where these are our lattice vectors. which define our unit cell. So we've got a solution to part 1a. Part 1b, which is in red. Uh, part uh, 1b uh, is a well-known problem. And the solution to this well-known problem uh, if you have a uh, Gaussian, in this case a single Gaussian, with charge density atrocious, uh, q over sigma squared square root of 2 pi raised to the third, maybe it's, let's make it bigger, q over sigma squared 2 pi to the 3 halves. Exponential of minus r squared over 2 sigma squared. So that's my Gaussian charge distribution. So then I can get a potential q over r error function of r over square root of 2 sigma if I define eta as 1 over 2 sigma squared and take the limit as r goes to 0 so I'm, I'm centering it uh, at the origin, then I get a solution V sub B is equal to 2 Q eta over pi to the 1 half. So I've got the solution to part 1b. And uh, now we need to do part 2. And part 2, uh, this is another well-known problem. This is a uh, called a double layer, right? Because you've got a point charge surrounded by uh, a cloud of charge of opposite sign. And I'm going to write the solution to this. Uh, this comes from uh, David Jackson's book, uh, Electrostatics, section 3.3. It's, it's a very well-known uh, electricity and magnetism book. Two is equal to the sum over L QL over RL, 
complementary, complementary error function of eta one half RL. Now, uh, this solution is for uh, spherical uh, shells uh, with radius uh, R sub L. And now the trick is to uh, choose this eta, which shows up everywhere in here, uh, carefully. This is the, the width of our uh, Gaussians, and by carefully, I, I mean brute force testing, but if, if you do this uh, and you get the right value of eta, uh, the potentials uh, will converge rapidly, and you wind up with a solution V is equal to the A minus B plus B two. So important things about about this, um, we can extend this A ball sum to unicells with multiple charge because we then will just take each uh, unit cell and we'll occupy it with different charges and we, we add together the charges. So the charge density is going to be the sum of charge densities. Uh, another important point is that uh, this smearing does not necessarily have to be a Gaussian. Uh, a Gaussian is kind of the easy way for us to think about it and to talk about it, but uh, the real problems and the numerical calculation we find oftentimes are Gaussians because um, we want to have convergence uh, which is more general and uh, is conducted faster. So let, let's, let's see what comes out of this now. Values of uh, alpha now depend entirely on the, the battle and constant depends entirely on geometry. So for a uh, rock salt crystal, we have uh, a Madeline constant of uh, 1.7 or 7. For a cesium chloride structure, 1.7627, and zinc sulfide, 1.6381. Okay, so we've got that, and well, we can come over here and use our uh, expression, which I cleverly erased to uh, to express the total energy. So this is uh, the Madelung sum and the Madelung energy. Now, continuing to talk about ionic crystals, uh, in the literature, you will see tables in, in which people uh, talk about 
ionic crystals in terms of the, uh, the structure and the uh, atomic radii, or the uh, ionic radii, more importantly. And that's a, a little bit uh, a little bit of a difficult way to think, I, I think, because you're trying to define where one atom begins and another atom ends, but it it, it does work. And uh, in particular, I'd like to talk about a, uh, a, a radii standardized table uh, that comes out of Charles Cattell's book. Uh, and, and in this, uh, he uh, talks about the interatomic distance in terms of the radius of species and the coordination number of those species. So he gives the uh, interatomic distance terms of the radius of the uh, cation plus the radius of the anion plus the coordination number and he's got a, a table uh, it's table 10 uh, in which he lists out the uh, coordination number correction. So uh, if we take, uh, for example, uh, barium titanate, and uh, barium titanate is a structure like this. It's uh, our archetypal structure is uh, cubic. We have barium in the very center. We have titanium, and then on the surfaces you have oxygen. Uh, we can see that barium has 12 uh, nearest neighbor oxygen. Uh, so the inner atomic distance is going to be the 12 plus the cation radius, uh, sorry, it's going to be equal to the cation radius 1.35 plus the anion radius 1.40 plus the uh, correction, the coordination number correction, which in this case is uh, 0 0.19 to get 2.94 uh, angstrom and the observed experimental value is 2.83 so it, it, it does work uh, fairly well but what's really important here is, is that we've now got an expression for the total energy in terms of uh, the geometry, and it's a fairly simple expression. And what that means is it means that now we're able to go and uh, express things such as the bulk modulus in terms of the uh, expansion of our total energy. And it, it allows us to get uh, insight into the physical properties uh, 
by expanding about the energy.